If you wanted to know what the mascot for the American military industrial complex was during World War II, you would have many strong contenders, from the Sherman tank to the Garand rifle or even the Fletcher class destroyer. Arguably, however, the title of mascot falls to the mainline bomber of the US Air Force, the B-24 Liberator, the most produced heavy bomber of all time. Beginnings of the Liberator would actually start with the most famous American bomber of all time, the B-17 Flying Fortress. Consolidated originally had been approached to produce licensed B-17s to fill out production numbers in the late 30s, but Consolidated had turned down this requisition, believing they could submit their own, more modern design to compete. The B-24's design is a radical departure from the more traditional approach of the B-17. Mounting a high-aspect Davis wing, it promised to have faster speeds, higher maximum altitudes, and longer range than Boeing's design. To deliver on that promise, the B-24 was to be powered by the Pratt & Whitney R-1830 engine, equipped with superchargers. As for payload, it would have two bomb bays, which individually had the same capacity as the B-17, meaning it could carry twice the amount, though it would rarely do so in action due to that high load significantly affecting range. The nose of the aircraft was mostly glass and somewhat similar in appearance to a greenhouse, while the fuselage was slab-sided and led to the aircraft's nickname of the Flying Boxcar. Unconventional for an American bomber was the tail assembly, being an H design with two vertical tail planes. Ironically, later it would be discovered that using a singular vertical tail plane was found to be more effective, providing better stability and control, though such alterations would only end up in the B-24's maritime patrol derivative, the PB-4Y Privateer. Defense, much like the B-17, would be a covering of 50 cal machine guns in a rear turret, a retractable belly turret, a dorsal turret, and waist guns. The nose of the B-24 would have two versions, one with several flexible ball-mounted 50 cals and a later G variant with a powered turret in place of the greenhouse nose. The reason the belly turret was retractable was due to the landing gear arrangement, which was a tricycle setup that used differential braking and thrust to achieve turning. Initial design work and prototyping was quick, leading to the plane's first flight in late 1939 and its production in 1940. Acceptance into U.S. service would be in mid-1941, though Consolidated would sell several examples to the likes of France and Britain under Lendlease before USA's entry into World War II. The on-paper advantages it had over the B-17 with increased range and capacity were very much real. The raw stats were a definite improvement. But the smaller factors were a step back, leading to many crews wanting to return to their flying fortresses in U.S. service. Such problems included the Davis wing handling poorly in colder, icy conditions, making the plane shudder even when only small amounts of ice had accumulated. The tricycle landing gear made taxiing the B-24 a hassle compared to the B-17, and to top it all off, the plane was cramped, despite being technically bigger on the inside, an example being the waste gunner station, which was not staggered like the B-17. Still, even with these small issues, the B-24 was a step up over the B-17 in every aspect bar one. Durability. The B-24 did not respond well to being shot at. At all. Damage that would only inconvenience or force a B-17 to abort would cripple or outright destroy a B-24. The overall construction was less rugged, with the wings and tails being prime examples. It also had a bad habit of flipping over onto its back during a water landing due to the high-mounted wing. Before the USA would get to use the B-24, however, the British would end up with several Liberators both from their own purchasing commission and several from France after it fell in 1940. Britain would use the Liberators in logistics and to fight submarines in the Atlantic, where its long range and high carrying capacity, as well as a lack of fighters it had to deal with, made it very capable. So much so that the Liberator would make up a considerable percentage of the number of U-boats sunk by aircraft, shared with the PBY Catalina. After the USA's entry into the war, it would use the B-24 in effectively every role a four-engine heavy bomber could be put into, serving in every theater of the conflict from Europe to the Pacific to Africa and even the China-Burma-India theater. In Europe, as the strategic bombing campaign began in 1942, laborators would fly alongside Lancasters, flying fortresses, and anything else with a range and payload to decimate Germany's industry. Facing German interceptors and flak guns, however, the Liberators would take heavy losses, even more so than their B-17 counterparts. In one account, after being strafed by BF-109s, a B-24 had its wing catch fire, and then completely break before the crew could bail out in time. The crews were generally unhappy with the Liberator despite its technical improvements, and would keep with more survivable B-17s till the end of the war for the European theater. 
In the Pacific, however, the range advantage alone made crews begrudgingly accept the B-24 as their new mainline bomber, which they would then use to good effect, helped by the lack of high-intensity flak barrages and interceptor coverage over the Pacific theater such as in Germany. Back home in the States, however, the B-24 was being mass-produced on a scale that only the raw might of the American industrial complex could accomplish. It was, like the B-17, distributed to various companies to build as many as possible to supply the demands of the front. But unlike the B-17, the companies contracted included the industrial powerhouse known as the Ford Motor Company, whose Willow Run factory alone could roll a fresh Liberator off the assembly line every hour. This would mean that by the end of production in 1945, a total of 18,000 Liberators were built, making it the most produced heavy bomber of all time. Post-war, however, the Liberator would be phased out of U.S. service in favor of the B-29 as its new heavy strategic bomber, though its maritime cousin, the PB-4Y Privateer, would continue service till the Korean War, and India would use the Liberators until retiring them in 1968. As a small note, the PB-4Y Privateer will be covered separately. Don't worry, it's not being skipped out here. As for today, there are 13 Liberators still around, with one flying in the USA, Diamond Lil from the Commemorative Air Force. Witchcraft, from the Collings Foundation, is technically airworthy, but has been grounded alongside the rest of the Foundation's World War II aircraft inventory following the end of Wings of Liberty in 2023, as the museum moved towards preservation of these aircraft rather than active flying display.